All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, if you are on Twitch, I am over in Canvas chat. I messed that up this morning, but fortunately, nobody asked a question anyway, so it ended up being okay. Um, we are in week nine. We're about halfway done with week nine, so just a, another quick review of where we're headed in the class today and tomorrow, and probably, or sorry, today and Friday, and probably Monday, um, we'll be looking at um, anonymous functions. We're going to finish up with some troubleshooting of FSOL today, but then there'll be anonymous functions um, until about Monday. And then on Wednesday and Friday, the last two days of class, we'll introduce the syntax for ODE 4.5 to solve systems of differential equations. Um, but that's not going to show up on homework, and it's not going to show up on the final. Um, it's just so that you have that knowledge when you get to a class that has it, you've seen it, and hopefully the syntax will feel familiar, um, and you'll know where to go uh, to look up the details. As that same dry spot from this morning. As far as assignments go, uh, homework five's out now. It's due Monday. Homework six will be out Monday and due the following Friday. But six will go a lot faster than the other ones because it'll be based on anonymous functions. Um, and we're going to get into those today. And I think you'll see there we can do in like one line what used to take us like six or eight lines previously. Um, so they're they're the bee's knees. Um, anonymous functions are great. Uh, and then the final will come out probably that same Friday, uh, and then you'll have four or five days to work on that. Um, just another reminder, the final is cumulative, but don't be afraid of that. It, it has to be cumulative, right? I can't ask you to do a final without creating variables like you did in week one. Um, so it is cumulative, but I, so is the midterm. Um, you'll be able to have like I said, about four or five days to work on it. Um, I can't go too much further past the last final date for the class because um, the registrar gets irritated if we set deadlines past your finals. Um, and you'll have to work alone on it. So it's not a team-based project like the midterm was. Um, but you'll still be able to ask me questions on it. It'll just have to work a little bit different than it did before. So that's where we're headed. Um, wrapping up the class pretty quickly now. There's not too much left. Um, so let's go ahead and get started uh, troubleshooting F-Solve. That'll take us about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, um, and then we'll introduce anonymous functions, and we can actually do a lot with those in just 10 minutes. Uh, let's see. I'm going to just generate some uh, notes in a live script here, um, and then we'll kind of switch back and forth between this live script and um, some functions that, and scripts that we can actually use uh, to illustrate some of these things. So the topic, at least initially, is troubleshooting um, F-Solve. And there's about three different ways that we can troubleshoot it. Hopefully, these three will fix your problem. Um, the first one is, well, what if I made like a syntax error or something's going funky and it looks like my code is okay, like the little green box says like, yeah, you haven't made, you haven't left out a parenthesis or something like that. Um, what can I do to look a little bit further at it. Um, well, as before, it's use the debugger. But there are some tips on using the debugger more effectively. Specifically for F-Solve, it is less common that you would need these tips for uh, like F0 or something else. It's just that F-Solve has its own internal error handling mechanism, um, which we're going to highlight here in a moment. And it's really easy to get confused by the amount of information that that thing puts out. So the first thing is use a plain script. The interface with um, live scripts still works, but it, it doesn't allow you to step into functions quite as much as a plain script does. And then the next two steps are um, to comment out the call to fsolve. So we're going to debug fsolve by not using fsolve. Instead of that, um, call your root finding function with your initial guess and with uh, breakpoints enabled. W remember, whenever you set a breakpoint, that means that you have enabled the debugger. The debugger is kind of always there. It's just not turned on um, until you set a breakpoint. So I'll save this really quick. And let's take a look at an example from uh, lecture 23. So I, it's probably not necessary that you 
type this out as we're going. It's probably easier to just watch because we're going to change a lot of stuff. Um, this function is currently set up correctly. So what I'm going to do is just copy this out and turn it into a script. That's our, our first problem. So let's just assume that we had a problem somewhere. Um, so we'll just make it a script like this. And I'm just going to leave it as um, untitled. Let's say that the, we have to introduce an error in order to make this work. We need an error to actually work with. Um, let's say that the error was that we tried to index in here to minus one. We know that that's not um, possible. So we introduce this error. Normally, it's a lot harder to spot an error like than you know, just recognizing that we indexed into um, minus one. But we're going to do this to demonstrate uh, sort of the problem with using um, fsolve and the debugger. This is currently set up to solve the problem. Um, so if I were to run this, we'll get an error, and it'll um, print out a bunch of stuff in the command window. The main error is this one. Um, it says down here at the bottom, there was a failure in the initial objective function evaluation. fsolve can't continue. And then it spits out a bunch of junk up here. Eventually, it does tell us that we, this is the line where we introduce the error, and it says the array indices must be positive integers or logical values. Typically, it won't go that far and actually tell us, oh, yeah, this was your specific problem. Um, or if it does, it's sort of abstract and you don't really know what it means. Um, so let's just ignore for the fact that we happen to be able to see exactly what our error is in here. Usually, we can't see it. So what would the next step be? Well, we're kind of stuck because it just says, I don't know, something went bad, and we don't know what else happened. There's just an error that sits inside there. If you were to put a uh, breakpoint on, say, line six, right? You wanted to figure out, all right, it's probably something in my local function. What happens? So we uh, run the script. The debugger pauses on line six, as it should. And then we want to start sort of stepping through our um, function. We can see over here in the workspace, uh, this is the workspace of the root finding function. So we can kind of monitor things over there. Um, and we hit step again. Great. It seems to have extracted that one. Normally, when I run this next one, we would expect that to just sort of beep out an error at us and say, you can't do that. If I click step again, it opened F solve and stuck us on line 261 of what appears to be a very strange looking function. I have no idea what all of this stuff means. This is why using the debugger in conjunction with F solve is not really recommended. This statement that's in here where you see First of all, you can't see a switch case, right? We've seen that before. Apparently, this is the fun case. Um, it has tried a statement which is called try catch. That's a way of coding into your functions a method of handling errors without just like cutting the whole thing out and saying like, nope, sorry, can't do it. The problem is that doesn't help us because fsolve has kicked us into its try catch statement, and we have no idea what any of that means, right? What we want is to see the actual error that was in the root finding function without seeing how um, fsolve is trying to handle that resulting error. That's the origin of this other note that I have here, which is comment out the call to fsolve. Don't use fsolve trying to find these sorts of errors, because they will inevitably kick you into fsolve, and you'll have to eventually just stop because you're sitting inside of a function that we don't understand. So the first line here, comment out the call to fsolve. All right, I'm going to do that. Get rid of the display, too, since we don't need it. And then the second one is just call the root finding function with the initial guess. So instead of all of that, we'll say RFF of Y guess. That's all I mean by call it with the initial guess. We can now re-enable the breakpoint that's down here on line 7. And now when I click Run and I step here, this is where I would expect the error to happen. I can go ahead and click Step. And nothing happens, right? I stay in, well, lots of things happen. I stayed inside of my actual script. It didn't kick me into this other one with a bunch of random error messages that I can't interpret. And the only error message that got printed to the command window is the one that is specific to that exact line, right? There's not eight other error messages that were somehow carried along through fsolve. So this is much easier to interpret that error message because it's very specific to just that local function. So that is my uh, first tip is don't use fsolve if you're getting these, if you're actually getting an error, don't use fsolve to try to track down the error. Kind of snip fsolve out of your problem 
um, and just focus on evaluating your root finding function at your guess, that in like nine cases out of 10 will track you down, track the error down much faster than trying to use um, fsolve. Once you've got it fixed, there's actually still stuff that we can do with this um, y guess, and that's gonna be the uh, source of our second tip. So I'm just gonna put this back. Actually, I'll leave this here since we're gonna um, post this anyway. This will be a good indicator of um, how to use that. So that's tip one. Tip two, we're gonna need a new example for this. Tip two is to um, check the scaling of the problem. Scaling is a, a new term. I don't think we've um, introduced this before. Usually, um, this comes up in a specific instance, and that's if f solve uh, runs but doesn't find a solution. So you wouldn't have to check the scaling until you've fixed up the problem with the debugger, right? There, it, at this point, there shouldn't be any errors. It's just the thing is saying like, oh, I didn't find a solution, or I found a solution, but I think it's crap, or something like that. That's the case of checking the scaling of the problem. What we mean by scaling, what you can do to check the scaling is the following. Um, so if you call your root finding function with y guess, the exponents of the answer should be about the same. And we say that these are of the same scale. And I'm gonna put that in bold because it's an important point. It's, it's not that y guess is of the same scale. It's not that I have to guess the answer is around like five for one variable and six for another variable. Those can be wildly different, right? They can be 0.01 and 55 or something like that. That's perfectly fine. What we're saying is the exponents of the answer need to be about the same. In other words, the answer of y, if you evaluate RFF with y guess needs to be roughly of the same scale. If it's not, then f solve is gonna have um, problems because if you think back to the uh, Excel thing that we did where we uh, summed up the squares of the two answers to the equations, what it's saying is one of those is vastly larger than the other. It's trying to set them both equal to zero, but as far as f solve is concerned, there's one of them that is taking up all of the space. The other one is essentially near zero all of the time, um, and it's only the other equation that's sort of dictating whether or not the solution is correct. So for, as far as f solve is concerned, a poorly scaled problem is like having one equation but two unknowns, which means it's just free to pick whatever it wants. It, it can't figure out whether or not it's right or wrong. So let's look at an example of a poorly scaled um, system, and I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to code this one up. Um, where is my, it's example two. So here's the example, and we're just gonna wait, or I'm gonna give you probably, let's go to about 320 um, to try to set up this solution and start your guess down here at nine and 430. I don't expect the uh, f-solve call to work and give you a solution at that starting guess. We're using it as an illustration. Um, but you should be able to code this up, I would say at least partially, um, in the next like five minutes or so. So we'll be back around, let's say 3.20 p.m. So see if you can code that one up and just get it to run, right? And then we'll explore the uh, behavior of it in a moment.
All right, I'm going to assume that I won't make any typos, which is not always a good assumption to have. Um, but let's start off with our standard syntax or sort of our standard template. So we'll start with our guess up here at the top. And then remember our call to F solve always kind of looks the same because we just bundle all of our variables into Y um, and then pass them to our root finding function inside of F solve like that uh, and then put our guess in afterwards. At least that's our, our plan at the moment. Um, and then we create our um, local function. So we'll say function, uh, I'll keep calling it out RFF of Y. And now we gotta get our buns in order. So we'll say top bun. And the top bun is just the variables that we have and we already picked the order up here when we said nine and 430. That actually corresponds to NA and T. This example, by the way, comes from um, reaction engineering, which is why some of the numbers look as large and small as they are. So NA is our first one, so that's Y of one, and T is Y of two. Give ourselves some space and write the bottom bun. The bottom bun is the equations in root finding form. So we'll start off with out of one, one. That'll be our material balance. I need to zoom out a little bit so that I can see the material balance at the same time, which is kind of tough. Na uh, and then minus 10 times a quantity of one minus R. So that's equation one in root finding form. Uh, and then similarly out of two, two, or sorry, two, one. This is our equation two in root finding form. So I'll start off on the left hand side and say 1650 times T minus 310. And then subtract off everything on the right. Um, so I chose here to leave the left and um, pull everything out of the right over onto the left, but you could have gone the other way and it, it would still work. So minus 335 e to the four. That number, just for background, it's rather large. It's an enthalpy of reaction. Um, and so it's being multiplied by um, R to figure out how much energy is being given off. And then we subtract off 15 e to the three. By the way, I preferably or tend to write 15 e three or 335 e four you could also write this as 15 times 10 to the three. It's just a little bit more writing to do it that way. Um, so I'm in the habit of using just E3. It, E3 means 10 to the three, it's the same thing. That times 398 minus T. So this is equation two in root finding form. And now we gotta ask whether or not if the function only knows about NA and T, can it evaluate these two equations in root finding form? Close, it's got the NA, but it also needs an R. Um, so we have to define an R, which comes from the equation up on the top, which is K times NA minus quantity of 10 minus NA divided by capital K, which is better, right? We've evaluated R, but now we have the unknown K and the other unknown K here, so we have to add those as well. Um, so capital K is 1.79 e to the minus 42. That is an equilibrium constant. Those are, uh, they can vary over lots and lots of orders of magnitude. So it's a really tiny number times a potentially really big number, which is an exponential of about 40,000 divided by the temperature. This other value, the little k is called a rate constant, 353 e to the 21, again those can vary by many orders of magnitude, times the exponential of this time minus 20,000 divided by T. That sort of stuff, remember, that, that's, that comes up in the classes, right? I, I'm just giving you the equations here. You would never need to know why they're there. But when you see numbers like on the one hand E to the 21, on the other hand E to the minus 42, it would not be unusual or unreasonable for you to say there might be a scaling problem with this system of equations because those have a difference of what, 63 orders of magnitude? That's a lot. Um, we don't often encounter that kind of scale, so it would not be at all unusual to say F solve might have some trouble with this one. We might have to help it out. So let me run this. Um, let's make sure first I didn't make any typos. I'm just expecting it to say I can't solve your problem. Perfect. Solver has stopped prematurely. As far as we're concerned right now, that's a good outcome because it means I didn't make any typos so I don't have to debug anything, right? There's no error messages or anything like that. But if we were to go over to our notes and say, I'm trying to troubleshoot F-solve, I don't need to use the debugger because there were no errors. 
So maybe I should check the scaling of the problem next. I'm going to call my root finding function with y guess um, and take a look at the exponents of the answer. So I'm going to comment out our f solve here. And I'm going to uh, call rff of y guess. So this illustrates the um, problem that f solve is encountering. As far as it can tell, the second equation, whenever you evaluate it at that guess, has a, a difference compared to the first of about nine orders of magnitude, eight or nine orders of magnitude. Remember, what it's trying to do is set both of these equations to zero. So as far as it can tell, that first equation is already zero. It doesn't have to change anything. It looks like zero, at least in comparison to the second one, right? The second one is like on the order of a billion or something like that. So no matter what it does, the first equation always looks tiny. It looks like it's already equal to zero. So what we want to do, according to this, is look at the exponents of the answer, and they should be about the same scale. A convenient way to look at the um, exponents uh, is to look at the output uh, in the variable window. So what that means is if we come over to our workspace over here and double click on whatever the answer was, right? This one is just called answer. And let's move this up here next to us. This will usually print in scientific notation. That's what we're looking for. The first few digits don't really matter. What we're really looking for is what comes after the e. In the uh, one case, we have e to the 3. And in the other case, we have e to the 8. And that one's really closer to e to the 9 because it's 9.9 .9 times 10 to the 8. So it's pretty close to e to the 9. That's the origin of our problem that f solve is struggling against, is this one is about six orders of magnitude bigger than the other one. So it just thinks the other one is always 0. So let's add that to our um, notes over here. The best case is uh, if the exponents are within about plus or minus 1 of each other, if that's the case, it's probably not a scaling problem or a scaling issue, i.e., we would say that the problem is um, well scaled. or scaled appropriately, whatever you want to call it. But ours are clearly not within plus or minus one of each other, right? One of them is about six orders of magnitude bigger than the other one. Um, otherwise, you can modify the bad equation, which is kind of your choice. Usually, though, it's uh, either the biggest or the smallest. Typically, we don't modify the other one. We just leave that one alone. And the way that we do the modification is by multiplying it or dividing by factors of about 1,000 or so, or whatever the um, scaling discrepancy suggests. So if you look in homework five, uh, that's out right now, there's a problem in there where each of the terms look like they were arbitrarily divided by 1,000. Even though you could factor that factor of 1,000 out and say, I, I should be solving the same problem, how come f solves not doing it? The reason f solves not doing it on your homework is because this sort of a scaling issue came up, and I introduced that factor of 1,000 to rescale them. For a problem like this, we need a much bigger factor of scaling, probably on the order of about e to the 6 or something like that. So we can come over to our uh, code. And usually, I just leave it the way that it is and then say out of 2, 1 is equal to out of 2, 1 times whatever the scaling factor is. And I can make that scaling factor anything that I want. I happen to notice that they were separated by about six orders of magnitude. So I said, OK, scale the second one until it's about six orders of magnitude smaller. Um, and that way, it'll be of about the same order of magnitude as the first one. The reason that we're allowed to do this, at least there's, there's two reasons. There's a mathematical reason, which is you're essentially just multiplying both sides of an equation by the same number. 
Um, the left-hand side is zero, so you can multiply that by anything you want, and it's still zero. So that's how we can sort of mathematically get away with it. The more practical reason for why might that show up in practice is because these equations are probably not in the same set of units. So for example, here, our first equation is material balance. That has units of like moles per second or micromoles per hour or something like that. And you're always free to set those units to be whatever is convenient for you. Whereas the second one in this case is an energy balance. So it has a completely unrelated set of units, right? This one, for example, was like joules or something like that. So there's no reason to expect that their scales need to be similar just because we chose an, uh, an arbitrary set of units. So occasionally we have to introduce this scaling factor, uh, kind of like a, a change of units, um, just to make the units reasonable. So if I run this again, we're expecting this answer now to have similar orders of magnitude. Not that it's small, not that it's close to zero. You can see here, these are still both on the order of 10 to the three but they're of similar orders, right? One is about minus three times 10 to the three, and the other one is about one times 10 to the three. Now we're in a pretty good position where we could expect F solved to at least not fail because the thing is not scaled properly. So if I remove this and now try to run F solve again, now it says, oh great, I can actually solve this. Because as I vary these two uh, variables, the NA and the T, the response in those equations is actually kind of close to each other. So I can see what the effect of that variation is, and then I can home in on whatever the answer needs to be by whatever algorithm it has um, chosen to use. So this is an example of um, scaling. Like I said, if you get to the point of scaling, that is probably after you have used the debugger, right? Don't check for scaling if the thing is just giving you an error. That would not be the source of an error, a poorly scaled problem. That would only be if F-solve has run, ran, um, but it hasn't found um, a solution yet. So that's scaling. There's one more um, that we'll actually get to on Friday because it's helpful to have anonymous functions to help us with this. And the last um, is create a surface plot. But this only works um, if you have two variables. But we'll come back to this on Friday. Because it's nicer to do um, a surface plot. It's easier to construct your surface plot if you already have the ability to write um, anonymous functions, just because it's fast. Um, although we can certainly write it with more local functions. It just, it's a little bit extra work. We'll probably do it with local functions first um, and then show you how to do it with an anonymous function on Friday. And that's kind of all I've got for you. If it's more than two variables and the scaling looks okay and there's no errors and F-solve is still struggling with it, you're kind of in a lot of trouble there. There's, there's not a lot of general techniques that you could use to figure out where's a good starting point in order for F-solve to solve this thing. Uh, it would be very problem specific what you would do after that. So I'll pause here for a moment because we're going to um, change topics onto anonymous functions. Um, remember, I am over in Canvas chat if anybody on uh, Twitch has any questions. But otherwise, we'll just kind of hang out here for a minute to finish up any typing you might have um, or any questions that you have, and then we'll move on.
All right, on to the next topic. We can close the examples that we had here. Um, we're gonna take a few notes, but we're also gonna use uh, the command window in a way that we, we haven't really touched on the command window too much up until now. We've mostly been writing scripts and functions. Um, but if yours is closed, you might wanna give it some space because uh, we are gonna use the command window. Uh, two helpful commands from the command window. One, you already know because we use them in scripts, which is clear. Um, if you type clear at the command prompt, these two double arrows, the two greater than symbols, um, that's the command prompt. The command prompt is inside the command window. Um, I usually use those terms interchangeably. If you type clear and look at your uh, workspace over here, it'll just wipe the variables from your workspace. We've already done that in scripts. Um, another one that we haven't needed to before is CLC. CLC will just clear your command window. So it kind of clutters up um, pretty quickly, so CLC will wipe it and let you start off clean. What we're gonna talk about now, the new topic, um, is anonymous functions. Anonymous functions are great. So the equation that we're gonna um, start with was that f of x is equal to x minus cosine of x. All I need you to do is remember that we used that equation a while back. Um, one of the first things that we had to do was plot that equation. And the way that we plotted that equation, we can kind of reproduce that process here at the command window without having to actually create another script. The way that we generally learned how to plot stuff um, previously was generate some values. So maybe we want to plot this thing from minus 5 to plus 5. So we generate x as linearly spaced from minus 5 to plus 5. What is x when that, that happens? Well, if you look over in the, the workspace, x is a vector. So if I create the variable f and say let f be x minus cosine of x, what's f? Well, f just follows the pattern of whatever x used to be. Um, and it becomes another set of um, vectors. And then if I want to plot it, I would say something like x, f, and I don't know, maybe a blue line, something like that. And I'll dock this plot so the folks on um, Twitch can see. So that's how we did it previously. It took a fair number of lines. Um, we were generating a couple of vectors. It did have something of a problem if you zoom in on your plot. The plot is only evaluated, the function was only evaluated at those data points that we gave it, right? If I zoom in a little bit and then maybe zoom in again on like three of these plots, it's just straight lines connecting these, right? There is no additional data in between there. The little dots are where the function was evaluated. It didn't evaluate them in between there which has never really been a problem because we can just add more and more data to it, but it would be nice if it could uh, redo that. The other thing to note is the way that we access f is as though it is a vector, right? So we access it through indexing. For example, I can say f of three. f of three is not actually x minus cosine of x evaluated when x is three, right? f of three is saying go into the vector that I have um, and tell me the third element which in this case is minus 4.8835. You could be forgiven if that was confusing, right? It, it's a function f. Normally when we would want to evaluate that, like in a calculator or something, we would say f of three and it would give us whatever f is evaluated at three. But we've been using these as vectors and so calling that sort of, um, or using that sort of syntax is different. Similarly, we can't evaluate it at non-integers so if I try to say f of 1.5, that doesn't make any sense, right? That's trying to find the space in between the first and the second element, and it doesn't exist. Nor can I give it, of course, negative values because indexing starts at one. There is a syntax that will allow us to use this in what's probably more familiar in a mathematical sense, and that's an anonymous function. So let's clear the workspace and clear the um, command window. The syntax for an anonymous function is to start with a variable, you can call it anything you want, like f or something like that, uh, and then to use that at symbol with the variable of choice, just like we have been in F0. 
As a matter of fact, F0 and F solve are defining anonymous functions in their syntax. We've been doing this the whole time. You can pull those out and it looks kind of like this. So when you say at x, you're saying this is going to be an anonymous function and its variable is x. Then I can write x minus cosine of x, just like I would with, um, I don't know, sort of a math syntax. If you leave the semicolon off and hit enter, you'll see that f is a new data type that we haven't seen before. It's called a function handle. It does have a value, but its value is its function, right? That is the thing that will be um, evaluated. Now I can do things like f of 2. If I call f of 2, I get a different answer. I actually get the function evaluated at 2 because f is now a function handle. It's an anonymous function. It's not a vector of data that I generated from somewhere else. I can also call things like f of 1.5, right, because it's now a function, or f of minus 1, right? All of that works just fine. So to create an anonymous function, The syntax for this would be f is equal to at x and then x minus cosine of x. Uh, anonymous functions um, pair well with so-called fun funds, which are function functions. If you don't know what a function function is, that's okay. You can say help fun fun. And it will give you a large list of mostly unnecessary functions, at least for us, uh, that are function functions, things that will play well with anonymous functions. So a good number of them have something to do with differential equations, either ordinary or partial. There's a few more up here that are for plotting. These can be really helpful. Um, there's two that we'll, we're going to pick out and use. Um, there are also some numerical integration ones that play very well um, with anonymous functions in general. And we might get to integral, but we don't, it's not that often that I need to numerically integrate a double or a triple integral, although it can be done. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. So two pair are particularly convenient. And here's what those two pairs are. The first one is that F plot pairs well with F0. So this is root find. If you want to do root finding uh, with one equation, those two functions, f plot and f0, go together very nicely. It's not that you need one or the other, it will, as we'll see in a moment. If you up the order by one, right, now you're going to do root finding but with two equations, then f surf pairs well with f uh, solve. This is root finding with two equations. If you need more than two equations, there's nothing that's going to help you. You're in a world of hurt if you can't do it with F solve on its own because you can't, there's, it's not like MATLAB is limited. It's, we live in a three-dimensional world, so there's no real way to plot um, higher order systems than two equations. So I'm going to close that figure, clear my workspace, and let's see how we can use um, f plot to do things that are a lot easier uh, than plotting things all out as uh, vectors as we did before. So let's define our function again as an anonymous function. So x minus cosine of x. If we would like to plot that function, this is probably something that you thought, like, why doesn't MATLAB have this capability where I just give it a function and say plot it? Because there's a, there's a website that a lot of students use that will plot functions for you. It's like Desmos, yeah, I think that's it. Where you just type in the equation and hit plot, right? It's like I want to plot it over a range. Why can't MATLAB do that? Why can't you just say plot this function? You can't. That's how you tell it the function, right? You have to put that kind of stuff into the other website too. And then you say f plot f, and it plots the function for you. 
there's no generation of um, vectors. There's no worrying about whether or not the vectors are the same size. There's only one input argument, which is just, I want to plot a function. There are additional things that you can pass to fplot to make it behave differently. So for example, maybe I only want to look between 0 and 5. You can give it a bracket and say, I want to go from 0 to 5. Right? And now it will plot it only from 0 to 5. You can change the line specifications um, the same way that you can with uh, a regular plot call. So for example, I want blue circles with lines between them. I can do something like that. So let's summarize the syntax uh, for fplot. Generally, this looks like fplot of my function handle, um, xmin, xmax, and a line spec. It's not common that we need more than that. The other nice thing about um, fplot is it does what the regular plot couldn't. Remember, the regular plot is just drawing lines. It says, you gave me pairs of x's and y's, and I connected them by straight lines, or I put dots there. fplot's not doing that. fplot is actually evaluating your function. And so if you zoom in, for example, I'm going to draw a box around just this one point. If I were to release the mouse on a regular plot, it would just zoom into that point, and it would look like a single point. If you do it on a plot generated by fplot, it actually recalculates the entire function in the range that you wanted to zoom in on. Um, and it can do that more or less indefinitely. So it doesn't lose any precision around areas that curve very quickly. Uh, and that can be really helpful. You can just keep zooming in, and it will continuously recalculate uh, your function um, and replot it for you. The reason that this pairs so well with um, F0 is because it's very easy to use fplot to find your root and then just pass that root over to F0. So F0, the syntax for that, is F and then tell it where you think the root is. So for example, our root here is somewhere around 1. Right? And it'll just pop out the root for you. So you, you've sort of offloaded the um, at definition to an anonymous function so that you can use it with fplot quickly figure out where the root is, which is made easier because you can just move around, right? In, in addition to zooming, you can use the uh, little hand and kind of pan around a little bit once you've zoomed in on the root. And then pass exactly the same function to F0, and it will pop out the root in the same way that it would have with the previous syntax. But we've done everything needed there in about three lines, right? One line to create the um, anonymous function, one line to plot it of varying um, complexity, depending on how complex you want to make your plot call, and one line to actually solve for the root. Far less than what we needed when we were writing scripts with local functions and generating vectors of data and all of that kind of stuff. Um, here we've done it with about three lines um, worth of code. And that's the power of an anonymous function. Um, they do have pros and cons to them. They're their pro, and it's a pretty strong pro, is they're so fast and they're so easy to use. You can just fire up the command window and get started pretty fast. You can certainly put them in scripts, too. There's nothing wrong with putting them in scripts. But there's a lot less to worry about in terms of the order of things happening. Um, about the only two cons that they have that we'll get into a little bit more on, thir on Friday is, A, they're a little bit more simplistic. So one of your homeworks from last time had a switch case inside of the local function. That's a little bit harder to implement with an anonymous function. Generally, if you can't write it in one line, eh, it's probably not a good candidate for an anonymous function. The other thing that it can't do particularly well is update itself. Once it's been defined, it's stuck that way until you redefine it. Um, and we'll, we'll poke around on those effects um, on Friday. But please don't use anonymous functions on homework five. Um, use them on homework six. They're, they're not terribly well suited for uh, systems of equations, although we can use them that way. Um, so don't use these on homework five. Wait until homework six. So I'll wrap it up there. Uh, if you're on Twitch, again, I'm over on Canvas chat. If you have any questions after the lecture, 
Um, otherwise, if I see you tomorrow in lab, I'll see you then. Otherwise, we'll meet back up on Friday. Bye, Twitch. <laughs>